Hi, I'm Carolyn Collins-Peterson, and for this special edition of The Astronomer's Universe, we're continuing our look at the January 2010 American Astronomical Society meeting in Washington, D.C. Conference attendees discuss everything from the latest research in astronomy, astrophysics, and space exploration to the best ways to teach the next generation about the cosmos. Their exciting science results cover planets, stars, and galaxies. The early universe is also one of the hot topics in astronomy research these days, and the Hubble Space Telescope is one of the observatories of choice when it comes to looking at objects that existed when the universe was very, very young. Images like this view of distant galaxies are among the most evocative ever seen. Hubble, which is sensitive in optical, near-infrared, and near-ultraviolet wavelengths, has allowed astronomers to make many amazing discoveries. Eventually, the Hubble Space Telescope will come to the end of its useful life, and a new generation of orbiting observatories will take up where it leaves off. The most ambitious future space-based observatory is the James Webb Space Telescope, currently under construction at Northrop Grumman. At AAS, we talked with Kevin Parsons of Northrop Grumman about the telescope, where it stands right now, and what it will be studying once it's deployed. What stage of construction is the James Webb Space Telescope in right now? Well, JWST is in the middle of phase CD, which is detailed design and construction of the actual telescope. We're actually approaching in this April of 2010, the critical design review, which is where design stops and full-scale production begins. Although, in reality, we've been building a lot of the flight hardware even now and have been for many, many years, especially the mirrors. The mirror elements, which you see here, there are 18 mirror segments, um, plus the secondary and tertiary mirrors. Those are, have all been in construction for at least four to five years because of the amount of time it takes to manufacture beryllium, to do the fine polishing, to get them ready for prime time. So those flight segments are all in the final polishing phases even as we speak. And what are you hoping to look at with the Webb Space Telescope? Well, the Webb Telescope has four main science themes. One is looking at the early the universe. In particular, we're looking at within 200 to 300 million years of when the universe is started. And so we're hoping to see some of the first light sources from the early universe, stars and galaxies. In addition to that, we, because we have such a great range and such incredible resolution, we should also be able to see so many galaxies that we understand a lot more about galaxy formation. Also, star formation and planet formation and planetary systems and planetary nurseries. So there's, there's four main science themes and, you know, as with many telescopes, you go in looking for one thing and half the discoveries are something you never thought you'd find. And so we're really excited about what we can discover through JWST. Astronomy and space exploration are beckoning to a future generation of astronomers and space scientists. This makes science education a high priority at AAS meetings. Astrocast TV's Dr. Harold Geller talked with Carrie Berglund of Digitalis Education Solutions, a company that sells full dome video planetariums to astronomy educators. Carrie, what do you see as the primary purpose of a planetarium? I believe the primary purpose of a planetarium is to educate and inspire people to learn more about the night sky, to get them thinking about what is out there and start to educate themselves about what, uh, what exactly they're seeing when they look up in the night sky. And how does the system that you have here compare to those large ones at, like the Hayden Planetarium, Rose Science Center in New York City and the like? It has many of the same um, software features. The main difference, though, is that you can pack this one up, put it in a car, and take it to a school. So take it directly to the schools rather than the schools coming to your fixed location. In many ways, that's more convenient for a school rather than organizing the field trip, bringing the field trip to the students. And how would you see this as helping people learn about the particular events going on in the night sky to, for a particular time of year? Hmm. Well, the nice thing is that you can set the sky for any date and any location on Earth. So you can fine tune your sky, make it set for your exact location, the exact time you're going to be observing, and figure out what is going to be up, where you should look for, say, the planet Jupiter or the ring nebula in the night sky. 
himself. So if an amateur astronomer was interested and wanted to see where he would look at in the sky, do you think this would help him locate that any time of the year during the night sky? Absolutely, absolutely. The astronomer would just set the software for the right location and the right viewing date, and then he'd be able to find it. One of the most interesting educational outreach projects we saw at the AAS meeting was a set of Braille books designed to make astronomy accessible to readers who are blind or visually impaired. They're also useful for sighted readers who learn best through touch. The images in each book are reproduced in color and with tactile dots. The creator of these products is Noreen Grice, president of You Can Do Astronomy. Hers is an interesting story of stumbling across an educational problem and solving it in a unique way. Tell us a little bit about the products you create. I try to make the universe accessible to people who have low vision or blindness. And I do that by making images which you can touch. So there's a color image, say, and then it has texture on it. So a sighted person can use it and a blind person can use it as well. How did you get started doing this? You know, it was weird. About 25 years ago, I was doing a planetarium show at the Boston Museum of Science, and there were a group of blind people in line, and I didn't know what to do. And the person I was working with said I should just help them to their seats. That's all I had to do. That's what I did, and I started the show, and then at the end of the show, I you know, said thank you for coming to the planetarium. And when the group came by the console, I came around, and I asked them how they liked the show, and, and they told me straight up, it stunk. And that got me started thinking about how to make astronomy accessible. So what was the first product you created? I actually started making pictures to go along with the planetarium shows. I was really concerned that the shows were not accessible, so I hand etched pictures of constellations. And that led to my first book, Touch the Stars. And right behind you, you have something called the Tactile Corona Nebula. Tell us a little bit about that. This is a project from the Space Telescope Science Institute, and they asked me to create the tactile graphics to make this particular image accessible. And at first we were going to make a big poster of it, and we tried different sizes, and it turned out that people didn't like big posters because there was too much empty space between the objects. And so it ended up that 11 by 17 was the perfect size to make it accessible for everyone. And that's this. Noreen's books are widely used and, like the celestial objects she illustrates, are inspiring new generations of both sighted and low vision students to dream about the stars. With more than 2,200 paper presentations and 3,500 attendees, this year's Winter AAS meeting in Washington, D.C. is one of the most prolific in astronomy history. For the Astronomer's Universe at the AAS meeting, I'm Carolyn Collins-Peterson, astrocast.tv.